What can we say? Our need. Speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. The series is entitled Knowing God. A more demanding subject could not be given us. The matter that we address is a matter that is the subject for the whole world, the subject of study. Before we go into our question for today, we need to shed light on the path we plan to take. The question of knowing God may mean more than what we think. Knowing. It means the establishment in the mind of truth. Knowing error is of little profit and sometimes is downright deadly. But knowing truth is profitable. It improves our abilities, it increases our efficiency, our ability to process life profitably depends on the information we have. Acquisition of information and knowledge is undeniably a human exercise from which none are exempted. From the very earliest moments of our consciousness, we begin to acquire acquaintance with our immediate environment. In this case, our mothers. And God has equipped us in our infancy with the ability to identify that which will keep us alive, namely the place where the milk is. Some knowledge is built into the nature of man. We have a word for that, we call it instinct. That is information that enables us to operate without thought. But there is information that we acquire by hearing. That also is important. Then we have information that we acquire not just by hearing, but by experience. And all of it increases our ability to operate and to function profitably in the world. The more we know, the more we are able but sometimes, of course, the more we know, the more trouble we have. Because to whom much is given, much is expected. And so knowing lies at the foundation of our competence. 
That's why we send children to school. That's why we are happy when they graduate. Because it means they have a level of competence. But we have to understand something, and that is life is not just the physical world that we see. Life is also spiritual. There are things visible, there are things invisible. And a loving and caring God wants us to be competent in both spheres. And the extent to which you have knowledge of both the visible and invisible is the extent to which you are competent in both spheres. And so we have to be competent. We have to be able. We have to function profitably, both with what we can see and what we cannot see. That which is physical and that which is spiritual. Because we are dual beings now, you can, you can argue the point, but I'm not really here to argue. I'm just going to tell you what you know, which means you think, but you cannot see your thoughts. So obviously that's an invisible part of you. And a lot of what you are is actually invisible to you. You have a stomach, but you've never seen it. And if I start arguing with you about whether you have a stomach or not because you have not seen one, you will think there's something wrong with me. The fact of the matter is that a lot of what we do is not necessarily based on what we see. And so you cannot insist that you are only going to believe what you see. Because the reality is a lot of what we deal with, we take by faith. Most of us have never seen our hearts but we believe we have a heart. Don't have to see it, but you know it. I'm leading to the proposition that there are lots of things that you know that you have not necessarily seen. And there are a lot of things that you believe that you have not necessarily proved. I want to take that further and say it's not necessary to know biology and microbiology and biochemistry to enjoy an orange. It's not necessary to know physiology and cellular biology to appreciate children. I'm trying to say here that there are a lot of things that we enjoy and that we believe and that we handle and that we touch and that we believe that, that we know without being able to prove anything. And so I want to say that it's not necessary to know things in order to enjoy life. You can enjoy oranges without knowing their science. You can enjoy children without knowing their science. You can enjoy uh, 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 rice without knowing how it forms a starch. As a matter of fact, I, wa I want to take this a little further and say, here's a problem. We take seeds, any seed, and we plant it. Now, if I came to you and I said to you, why are you planting the seed? You are going to tell me I am planting the seed because I want to eat maize or invest it in something at some point point and your hope that after you've invested it you're going to get a return in the form of happiness everybody is investing whether in good or in evil but there is no such thing under this sun as an unbeliever because everybody 
is investing somewhere. And so the question that we have to address is what are you investing in and when you are done what are you getting back we want to know the end of the activity what is the sum of your life you have invested 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. When we squeeze the juice out of that whole thing, we say in English, the distillate, that which remains after everything. When we squeeze your whole life and reduce it to the sum of what you are worth at the end of your life, what do we get? Because you see, if you invest, there must be a return. And so the question of life is when you are done, what are you worth? What do you get? Now we can argue about that all we like. The fact of the matter is that ends matter. The way the story ends. I'm excited by the fact that my children are grown up. But I'm really wanting to hang around because I want to see my grandchildren. I want to see what happens. This story is not that we are dead. We have children. They have children. Their children have children. The fact of the matter is that the story of your life is not yet finished just because you die. It carries on in your children and great children and great grandchildren. I'm trying to tell you brothers and sisters that the story of life is bigger than you. And so, you cannot insist. You cannot say but unless you are satisfied by the answers you are not going to believe because the reality is the story is bigger than your mind can appreciate. You have to be a bit more careful by the position you take. I'm more inclined to say, let us become realistic. Life is a school. And every one of us is learning something a day at a time. And the fact of the matter is life is shorter than all that we have to learn. Now if there is a God, and I believe there is a God, and you insist that he must be fully understood by you in your short little life when up until now some of us here have failed to understand mathematics alone never mind physics chemistry we have failed to understand some things and all of a sudden we are insisting that we must understand God fully I wrote a subject when I was younger, it's called uh, Debele. It's a, it's, it's a dialect of the Zulu language. And I failed it. Now if you're going to fail what you can see and read, how are you going to pass what you cannot see and read? If you can fail one subject, and the world is many subjects and it's one world how can you insist that you must fully understand God in your short life because you have two problems the first problem is that capacity you might not even have sufficient memory to pass mathematics how are you going to have sufficient memory to pass God so let's talk about that alone you have the problem of capacity. You also have the problem of time. If all you could do was study trees, you would die before you finish studying trees. Because there are so many of them. 
just in Canada alone. And then there are African trees and there are Australian trees. I mean, I know of people that have gone to university and studied one little thing and died studying it. And their professor, what, 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 in one little thing. In fact, you would not have a single PhD in the world studying today who is not studying a lot about less. Because when we go to university, they tell you, specialize, you can't study everything. And what they mean by that is, you don't have time to study everything. Study one little thing and that will exhaust you. After four or five years of studying it, you'll be so tired, you just want to retire. So life is not long enough for us to battle with impossible questions. Life has some basic questions. And it is those basic questions that God addresses because they are fundamental to our ability to move beyond the now into eternity. In other words, brothers and sisters, there are ladders, there are bridges of knowledge that enable you to go through life and enjoy life for the short time that you are here and still be able to access more time in eternity. In other words, our problem is we don't have enough time to learn all that needs to be learned and therefore if you insist that you want to have all knowledge before you can believe in God, you will die before you have all knowledge and you will die an unbeliever. So we have to look at at some basic problems. The first one of which is time. The second is capacity. You know brothers and sisters every day of our lives we notice we make mistakes is that right we forget certain things and uh, we miss certain things now what we what we call that in english is that we have systemic failures in other words your system is not functioning properly and therefore, when God deals with us, he doesn't deal with us as if we are functioning perfectly. No, the Bible says, by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So, from the biblical perspective, when God is dealing with human beings, he is dealing with them exactly as they need, not as they profess. He gives them grace because he knows they forget, they get tired, they get weary, they lose their patience. Are you with me? They, they have systemic malfunction. So he deals with them with grace. He makes up the difference every day just to keep us going. We must not behave as if we are fully competent. It's not true. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you are, you need grace. God must deal with you with mercy. Now, the other thing is you must have faith. Because you don't have all knowledge. Are you with me? Because you don't have what? All knowledge. God must deal with you as an ignorant person. And again, deal with you by faith. That means what you don't know should not bother you. Just trust God with what you don't know. We have a problem because once we begin from the premise that we are fine and we are competent and we are coping, we disqualify ourselves for the grace of God and the methods by which he is going to take us out of trouble. We need faith, we need grace, we need long suffering on the part of God, we need kindness, we need forgiveness. All these things are necessary because of our condition. And once we reject them, we cannot be helped. 
because there is no agreement between our condition and our profession. Do you realize, brothers, that if you really think about it, we were designed to enjoy life not so much to understand it. You can really enjoy an orange without understanding it. You can enjoy children without understanding them. It's not those who know who win the game of life. There are many educated men and women who are going to be defeated by this life. Because it doesn't matter how competent and knowledgeable you are, this world will defeat you. Because it's bigger than you. It's got bigger problems than you. It is just bigger. The only way you become bigger than this world is to connect with God who is bigger than the world. I'm reminded of the story of a little fish. This fish has to move every year from the from somewhere in British Columbia. And of course this little fish, if it tried to swim, would never get to the South Pole. So what this little fish does is that it settles onto the back of the whale. Now whales move every year from British Columbia to the South Pole. And so this little thing, it does nothing. It just sits on top of the big fish. And the big fish takes it all the way to the South Pole and brings it back. And it breathes and takes it back. See, this little thing has figured out. I'm not going to make it. Let me just sit here. And I just sit. And every day I'll eat little things I find here. But my main job is to just sit. And the Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. It is not the very active people that are going to win in this thing. It is those who are still and who just sit there. You know, David says, one thing I've desired of the Lord, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I just want to dwell there. Jesus comes around and says, abide in me and I in you. Just abide. Just sit there. And you'll make it. Whilst the very active are destroyed by the ocean of sin. You just abide. But you see, in order to abide, you must believe. And we have to look at this and say to ourselves, let's assume that there is no God. As some would like to believe. Let, let's assume that there is no God. Do you realize that the tsunami of troubles and trials that define this planet demand that you have a God or you don't make it beyond the grave? You're just not going to make it. This is a desert. You need somebody bigger than the desert. You know, God was trying to illustrate this thing to the Israelites in the Old Testament. And this is how he put it. He says, with a strong arm, I will take you out of Egypt. With a strong arm and wings, I will carry you to the promised land. The way we make it out of this world, I don't care whether you choose to believe or you don't choose to believe, you are going to need to be carried out of here. Some strong hand must take a hold of your life and set you free from the limitations of living in a sinful world. Not going to make it got a ride 
the whale. And you don't have to be super intelligent. Just take the orange and eat it. And you will get vitamin C. And so that's how it is with the word of God. When the word of God is preached, don't try and be too clever. Just sit there and listen. What harm can it possibly do? If you just sit there, just sit there and listen. And the word of God will come into your soul. And will do for you what you cannot do for yourself. What harm can listening do? I... I I like to say this to my atheist friends. Just because life has given you a raw deal does not mean the only answer to pain and grief is anger and rebellion. No? It doesn't have to be. There are other reactions. One reaction, if life has disappointed you, the answer is not to say there's no God. No. If life has disappointed you, the answer, the correct response should be, I don't know. Part B of that is, go on your knees and ask God. All of us have limitations. Amen. And all of us have struggles. The answer is not unbelief. The answer is to seek God. There must be a God. And if, if there were no God, we would still need one. If doubt and unbelief is your answer to life's problems. I want to suggest it's a poor answer because it's not a solution. If you're not going to believe in God, you still need an answer to the problems and the challenges that you face. I've read books and other languages. And I've come to the conclusion that every religion is trying to answer some basic questions that we begin with. The first question is, what is life? Second question, what is the point of life? Third question is, where is life going? Where am I going to end? If you summarize all that, all religions are trying to give us meaning. Every one of them. And the choice that you and I have to make is, what of these explanations, which one of these explanations about life makes the most sense? Which one can I invest myself in? Which one can I believe? I've got my life in my hand. I want to go and invest it in the stock exchange so I can get interest at the end of my life. What? Where? Who? What do I put myself in? We are investing ourselves. And I want to suggest to you that the God of the Bible makes the most sense to me because he answers the questions that I have and the questions are answered in such a manner that the answers are personal. Have you noticed that? Personal victory. Did you know people that it doesn't matter what happens to you if you are defeated physically outside and your soul inside is still standing in courage and faith you are not defeated because until your spirit is defeated you are not defeated and so God knowing that he feeds the spirit he feeds the inner man he knows that if you are still standing inside even though you are under pressure on the outside you are still standing we all die but the question is when you die are you still standing God wants to give you victory over life 
to die standing. There is a bigger story here. If this life was all there is, if this life was all there is, the people with cars and houses and lands and education would be the successful people indeed. But life is physical and spiritual. Success in the material is not necessarily success in the spiritual. And we must have success in both. So I want to challenge every atheist. Yes, you don't believe in God. Yes, you don't like God. Yes, you are bitter because life has disappointed you or things have gone wrong. The fact of the matter is, what is your answer to the spiritual? What happens when life treats you badly? Are you still standing? Do you have an answer? I've got to give us a couple of scriptures here as I prepare to, to wrap up our discussion here. I want us to go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It says, this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. From a biblical perspective, the most important thing is victory. And the thing we have to overcome is the world. And to do that, you have to have faith. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you go to, um, I'm just trying to organize my papers here because of the wind. 1 John 5 verse 4, victory is the victory that overcomes the world. But I like John 4 verse 7. John 4 verse 7, is actually the whole of chapter 4 of John, Jesus sits by the well and a woman comes to the well. She's coming to get water. Every day she's got to take water to the house to cook, to wash. Water is very important for physical cleanliness, very important for food and cooking. So she's coming to take care of life at the well. She finds Jesus there. And Jesus says to her, please give me water. And the woman says, but you're a Jew. I can't I can give you water. And then listen to the answer. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says unto you, give me water to drink, you would have asked of him and he would have given you water. Living water. Now, that amazes me because Water quenches thirst. Hello? Water quenches thirst. And thirst in the Bible is a symbol of questions that we all have. Every single one of us has questions about our lives. What's going to happen to me? Where am I going? I'm getting old. What's going to happen to me? We have questions and questions and questions. Jesus says, you're thirsty. And we go to the wells of this life. We go to universities, we go to work, we, we, we buy and we sell and we drive and we, we are busy trying to answer life's questions. We are thirsty. But guess what? After we have worked and we have been pensioned, we sit in old people's homes and the big question is, now what? You know what we do when we get there? We look backwards. We wish for our sons to visit and our daughters to visit. Our lives have come to an end and the question of life is still not answered. Now what? Jesus says, you will never be in that situation if you believe in me. If you believe in me, I will give you answers that will answer every question that will quench your thirst. Even when you come to death, I have an answer. It's called the resurrection. Amen. There is no question of life that I cannot answer. 
You see, if you don't have God, let, let me define God in simple terms. God is answers to the question of life. Please give him a chance to talk to you. Don't be proud and difficult and angry. Getting angry and walking away and becoming an atheist doesn't give you answers. It just makes you a confirmed unbeliever. You need to be still. You need to wait. Give God a chance to answer your questions. And it takes time to do that. You got to make time for God. Got to make time for God to talk to you. You've got to make time. In John chapter 1 verse 9. John says this is the light. Which lightens every man born into the world. God has light. God has knowledge. God has answers. What God does not have is the ears of people and their time. And the devil is making sure that the western world is so busy they have no time for God to speak to them. Now what God is going to do, he's going to shut it down so that he can talk to some people. Because the problem is, people are not listening. And they are dying for lack of knowledge. When there is water, which if you drink, it will quench all your thirst. Please don't tell me you there are answers to life. Don't tell me you are dying hopelessly because there's no answer to death. The point is you are not listening to the answer. Don't tell me that sickness is a problem because there is an answer to sickness. The truth of the matter is this whole world is not a problem because there is an answer to the world. But do you have time for God to quench your thirst? The God question is a big question. It requires time. Even if you've been a believer in the church for many years, you need to make time for God to answer your questions. Because the God question needs time. God than the world. I'm reminded of the story of a little fish. This fish has to move every year from the from somewhere in British Columbia.